We all do it. We don't like it, but it has to get done. Some of us try to cheat, take shortcuts, not wanting to put the work in, and it shows. We try to get other people to do it. Friends, family, strangers, our children. In fact, Nick Offerman suggested that that's the reason to have children. Yep. We're talking about sanding. In episode 91, this is going to rub you the wrong way. Hi, my name's Roger Kugler. This is Working at Woodworking Podcast, where I hope to encourage you, the skilled DIYer, weekend warrior, amateur woodworker, to become professional. You have skills You can do things, you can fix things, and in this day and age, we need people like you to step up, hang out a shingle, start a small business, open a checking account in a business name, or your name doing business as, and start making some money. Start helping your community, solving these little problems that they have that for a lot of people means so much to them. The dog chewed the leg off of great-grandmother's cabinet, the one with all the pictures adorned so proudly that you remember as a child. Yeah, leg's gone. Dog puked it up. You can fix that and make the owner so incredibly happy. Heads up. Make sure you stay tuned to Miss Jobs. I've got something interesting that I think could very easily be a business opportunity. And I also want to thank listeners on Apple. I figured out how I can go to Apple iTunes and look up my podcast and see all the stats and see the comments that you have left. I thank you so much. I know I'm not the the most tech-savvy person when it comes to this podcasting thing, but I really do thank you. I appreciate that. Very, very kind words uh, were, were left. So, show of hands, how many of you actually like to sand Yeah, I don't even need to see you. (laughs) Uh, There's no hands being held up. Mm -mm, Nope. Honestly, how many of you have projects sitting in the back corner unfinished? The only thing besides sanding that woodworkers probably hate more is finishing. And that's why we have professional finishers. These are incredibly talented, but let's be honest, slightly weird people who actually enjoy this stuff. They enjoy the sanding. They enjoy the the fiddly little correct this little error, fill in this little crack, and then put down this finish that just makes the, the piece pop. That's what people spend money for. And there are professional woodworkers who get this. They actually hire professional finishers to finish what they've built. And of those professional woodworkers, they all seem to be doing pretty well. Hmm, maybe they know something that we don't. So why do we need to sand? Well, it makes our projects look good. You've certainly have seen furniture that had a crappy sand job. Oftentimes in the showroom floor of some big fancy furniture store. It's like, seriously? They're getting away with this? So sanding is a critical part of your build process, whether it is furniture repair or you're trying to make something look like something else the rest of the piece or it's new construction where you're building that china cabinet sanding is absolutely critical and it's something that we kind of just take well almost for granted and we shouldn't the first record of sandpaper is from 
China about the 13th century where they used crushed shells and seeds and sand glued to paper or leather. Shark skin has been used for centuries as a sandpaper. And craftsmen have long made their own sandpaper. You know, taking old bottles, glass, crushing that up and sifting it, and then gluing that probably with hide glue to either leather or paper or, or even cloth. In 1833, John Oakley in London figured out how to mass produce sandpaper. He was using what was called frit, which is a, a glass-like substance, a ceramic. And this was a, a major Im improvement over sand. Sand is round, and it tends to crush wood fibers, where this frit, this ceramic, had sharp edges that tended to cut. And we're kind of in that same same boat today. But it took about a century for the 3M company in 1921 to invent silicon carbide wet dry sandpaper. And this was widely used in the automotive finishing business. You could use a lubricant as a carrier for what had just gotten sanded away, you know, on these super fine paint jobs, totally revolutionized the auto industry. And now here in 2024, you know, a century later, we have, oh, about 20 billion different flavors of sandpaper. Oh my gosh, it's so confusing. So in this episode, I'm not intending to turn this into either a history lesson or a crash course in Abrasives 101. Nor do I intend to make this a sales pitch on one particular sandpaper brand or one particular sanding system over the other. What I am going to do is share my experience with sanding. Now, way back when I was a kid, wee lad, you had a piece of flint paper-backed sandpaper Hey, there was nothing better than that. I can remember my grandfather trying to keep me, well, honestly, out of mischief. Give me a piece of wood. Give me a piece of sandpaper. <laughs> Entertained for hours. Sometimes we'd wrap the sandpaper around a <clears throat> sanding block. But this was just a piece of hardwood, you know, maple, something like that. You know, because if you used one of those store-bought sanding blocks. Well, I mean, you know, the kids in the neighborhood would beat you up for that. I mean, it was a rough neighborhood. And then high school. High school shop class. Bring out the belt sanders. Everybody used belt sanders. It was all the rage. Well, not everyone, but Anyone doing woodworking certainly owned a belt sander, typically a craftsman. And if you have any experience with a belt sander, <laughs> yeah, what a disaster. I can remember perfectly beautiful projects in shop class being totally ruined with the overzealous use of a sandpaper, of a, a belt sander. Then we had block sanders, the jitterbug. No, not that jitterbug. The little jitterbug sander, the thing vibrated like crazy. You know, zzz, you know, it actually did a fairly decent job. You know, it was better than sanding by hand. After those, I ended up with a Porter Cable block sander. This was probably the first real modern sander that I owned. And again, it was... It was a forerunner to the random orbit sander. And honestly, it did a, a pretty darn good job. But, you know, after s several years, actually decades, yeah, it kind of flamed out, you know, like fire. 
you know, it sat on the workbench. There was smoke pouring out the thing, you know, unplug it, throw it out the back shop door. And it worked. It worked really well for small jobs. If you had like a, a big kitchen table or a, a door or something like that that you had to do, OMG, it would take forever. So I got the bright idea that I'd buy a Porter Cable 6-inch sander. Not a 6-inch random orbit sander. That was a little too too advanced for the time. This was a 6-inch direct drive sander. I thought I had died and gone to heaven. This thing was so fast. In fact, it was a little too fast because that three-quarter inch piece that you were working on, it's now five-eighths of an inch. Wow, that thing was swirl city. So kind of back to the old block plane. Finally, I joined the 21st century. Festool ETS-125 REQ, about $200. <coughs> yeah, excuse me. Yeah, about twice the price that you could buy a good DeWalt random orbit sander, 5-inch. But I, yeah, honestly, I kind of fell down a rabbit hole. What a disappointment. Fish hooks, pigtails, Makita marks, whatever you call them, it looked like crap. You know, this is a $200 sander. This is a Festool. This is supposed to, to be like smooth as a baby's bottom. This is supposed to be absolutely perfect. No need to hand sand. What's going on here? Well, I went back to the shop where I'd bought it and started to explain my frustration and dissatisfaction with the expensive tool. And the shop owner, very good guy, just kind of smiled and said, you hooked it up to your shop vac, didn't you? Well, yeah, duh. Turns out that the efficiency of this sander was so much greater than anything else that when you hooked it up to a standard shop vac, it would suck itself right down into the wood that you were sanding. So it had no choice but to just scratch and claw its way through the wood. And he told me that if I back off on the suction, it will produce the best finish I'd ever seen. So, back to the shop, figured out how to build a throttle, a vacuum throttle, which is kind of weird, for my dust droid. And I, it was basically a piece of, you know, a couple pieces of PVC pipe with a hole drilled in that I could open it wide open to really cut down the vacuum uh, suction or throttle it by closing a slide over that great big hole and increasing the suction. And after playing with it for a while, I got really, really good results with it. I was very happy with it. And yeah, I'll admit it. I'm a member of FOG, Festool Owners Group. But that has not stopped me from occasionally going on in a Saturday night and going into the, you know, Festool Users Group forum and, you know, throwing a comment out there about how great Harbor Freight tools are. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's good fun. Yeah, I'm the guy. Well, there are several of us, but uh, it's always good to stir the pot every now and then. Now, my memory's a little foggy. I taught woodworking classes at this particular shop. Great shop, wonderful venue for teaching classes. It's no longer in business. But the owner knew that I'd kind of taken a shine to Festool. And he kind of worked out a deal where I would teach for Festool. Because I'm honestly, I'm just not smart enough to go out and buy Festool. I've got to trick my lizard brain into, you know, acquiring Festool without the outlay of cash. And looking back at it, I don't think it was a real healthy relationship. It was a little bit like that creepy drug dealer that hangs out on the outside of the schoolyard with these little bags of uh, <clears throat> candy. I just couldn't say no. And 
one led to another and before I knew it I'd moved from the ETS onto a an RO90 Rotex for a a new job of course and then just like a couple months later I'm mainlining an RO150 someplace along this bizarre ride I ended up with a CT MIDI dust extractor Whew. Give me a moment, please. <clears throat> yeah, that MIDI dust extractor, that was a game changer. I didn't have to fool around with the throttle on the dust droid. Oh, the dust droid? Yeah, this is a good story. I had pretty much gotten fed up with emptying the shop vac because the bloody thing fills up, like, all the time. And you, you take the, the top off, the power head, and you've got this big open bin of dust and debris, and you have to dump that out. And obviously you take it out to the, to the trash can, you upend it, and you, then yeah, you're covered in dust. You know, you're, you're breathing in all that stuff that you were trying so hard not to breathe in. Yeah, you could use a trash bag and empty it into the trash bag, but still, God, that was messy. There's got to be a better way. So what I came up with was a, I don't remember the exact dimensions. It was someplace around an 18-inch square plywood box on casters. It was about 18 inches deep. Into this, I would insert a trash bag. To keep the trash bag from, you know, getting sucked up, I made a El Cheapo plywood frame that would hold the bag open. On, on top of this, I made another box, plywood box, same dimensions, and inside contained one of those little cyclone you know, those mini cyclone, uh, from Oneida, I believe, uh, just the short little guys. And on top of that, I tore apart the power head on the shop vac and cut a hole and mounted that right on the top. So it was kind of domed. That's why I gave it the nickname a, a droid. And everything was plumbed and connected inside. It worked really, really well. It had a small footprint, the same size as the, the original shop vac. It was on casters. I could move it any place I needed. It had really, really good suction, maybe even better than the original shop vac. I used that for years. To empty it, you pop the, the top off of it, pull out that little plywood frame thingy, and gather up the trash bag, seal it, take it out to the trash bin, boom, you're done. Easy peasy. My wonderful shop droid got killed by the Festool MIDI dust extractor. No comparison. And if any of you are out there kind of on defense, just go for it. Just take the leap. It's only going to hurt for a little while. Number one, I didn't have to fiddle around with throttling the vacuum using the various sanders. The MIDI already does that. It has a selection of, you know, suck a golf ball through a hundred foot garden hose to just a light breeze whiffing through the hose, which is absolutely perfect when you're doing a finished sand. Because it's, the efficiency of the sander is so great that just a little bit of airflow sucks all that dust up off the surface, leaving what I consider a perfect finish. So I really, really th believe that vacuum with a sander is super important. Number one, it's going to leave a better finish. If you're not using a vacuum to evacuate the sanding dust, you're leaving that sanding dust and any broken off worn grit right under the sander and you're literally grinding that back into the wood. When you're hand sanding, 
if you notice that as you're moving in a reciprocal fashion back and forth with the grain, your sanding dust is getting expelled from under the sandpaper. It's just kind of a natural motion, but not with a machine. The machine tends to trap that swerf under itself and just will literally grind it back into the wood unless you vacuum that out of the way. Number two reason to use a vacuum is it's cooler. I mean, not like you're the coolest kid on the block type thing, but temperature-wise, that vacuum doesn't allow the heat to build up in the sandpaper. And heat is the number one killer of sandpaper. If you can keep that sandpaper cool, you will get much, much longer use out of it. Number three you have a clean shop. You don't have sanding swerf dust blowing all over the place. You know, because the the typical random orbit sander has a built-in fan to keep the motor cool. And, you know, you turn it sideways, you know, a little bit and, you know, it blows all that sanding swerf that has been grinding into the wood all over the place. Yeah, I know. You use that little bag that is attached you know, that comes with the uh, the sander. Ah, yeah, that was thought up by the marketing department. Yeah, those don't work. They're crap. So you got to use a vacuum. Even if you have to build a throttle for your shop vac, use a vacuum on your sander. Now, the other thing I did with the, uh, the Festool MIDI, I bought the Wi-Fi switch which the, the MIDI was one of the, was one of the models that came with built in Wi-Fi in the vacuum itself. You had no way of using it unless you spent, it was like 50, 55 bucks for this little switch that straps to the hose that you can turn it on and off without going back to the vacuum. Game changer. Yes. It is so, so convenient. You need to vacuum something up. You grab the end of the hose, the business end of the hose, and you press the little button, and the vacuum turns on. Wow, what a concept. You don't have to grab the end of the hose, walk over to the vacuum, turn the vacuum on, go back over to where you needed to vacuum something up. Yeah, it cuts all of that out. And, you know, if you're professional and you're trying to make some money at this, if you can eliminate 12 steps... That's just a little bit more money you put in your pocket. So to kind of recap, assuming that you're not, haven't been keeping notes, I use the Festool RO150 about 80% of the time. Now, if you're not familiar, the RO stands for Rotex. And Rotex is a dual mode sander that is both a direct drive and a random orbit. What's good about that direct drive? If you need to remove some wood, it will remove some wood. Remember that old Porter cable, six inch that I had that would reduce three quarters down to five eighths, you know, in like a second? Yeah, this Rotex will do the exact same thing. I don't even know where that Porter cable is. I haven't used it in well, decades. So you have the advantage of a big machine that can just hog away some wood. You know, if you're buying rough wood or if you're doing, you know, like slab furniture, I mean, this thing is just a workhorse. You put some 80 grit on there and just hold on because it's there's some power behind this. You will not stall this machine. Then you flip a little switch and you're into random orbit mode. And with the vacuum and the right sandpaper and the right touch, it leaves a finished finish. I mean, I can use it to finish the finish. I mean, it's, it's, it's that good. I think the only downside to it is it's like five and a half pounds. And if you have any shoulder injuries or you know, you're just not physically very strong, it can wear you out. Now, the ETS-125, 
I use that probably 15% of the time. Um, it's smaller. It's five inches. The RO150, that's 150 millimeters or about six inches. And the 125 is five inches, 125 millimeters. Um, I use it, well, frankly, whatever my arms wear out using the, uh, the 150. Uh, it's lighter. It's a little more nimble. I can sand longer with it. And there are some projects that, it's just easier to control a smaller sander than it is a bigger sander. Now, my little RO90, which has that dual operation between the random orbit and the direct drive, honestly, maybe 3% of the time I'm using that. But when I do use it, there's really nothing else that will do this particular job. Now, 90 millimeters, that's about 3 inches. So it can get into places that these other machines can't even think about getting into. And one of the real strengths with the, the, uh, RO90, and I don't think they advertise this very well, is it comes with a triangular oscillating sanding head. So if you need to get into corners, this is the machine that will do it. So I would call it a, a specialized tool and I can re I can remember that I turned down a job years ago that the RO90 would have been absolutely perfect in fact at that time I was even thinking I could go ahead and spring for the RO90 and get this job but I just didn't so that was really the second tool that I bought just in case that job came around again I would have the tools to do it other sanders I have, I have a, a fine multi-master. I bought this at least two decades ago. I had one specific job that, oh man, that would be perfect for this. And I spent the money. It was not cheap, you know, 20 years ago. And it has paid its for itself over and over and over and over. It will do things that no other tool will do. Now, I use it primarily for cutting because you can put all kinds of different blades on it. It also comes with a triangle sanding head that I have used on several, several different jobs where I just needed to sand this tiny little edge like 500 times. And this little thing will do it. The nice thing about these, this triangle sanding head is it's made out of plastic and they're cheap. They will eventually wear out. Again, heat destroys sandpaper and it destroys the adhesive and the Velcro, I'm sorry, the hook that is holding the sandpaper onto the, onto the pads. But they're cheap. You can just replace them. And since they're made out of plastic, they're really easy to cut to a specific shape that now you have this oscillating, vibrating sander that you can get into tiny little cracks and crevices that you would, well, you'd have to hand sand that. And sometimes you can't even, it doesn't even work very well for hand sanding. Now I've included in the show notes a link to a YouTube video where this guy is showing how he uses the, where he shows how he uses the fine multi-tool with the steel cutting blades wrapped in cloth and then covered in sandpaper to get into incredible nooks and crannies. He does primarily sculptural type work, and it is amazing how he uses this to sand. Uh, check that out. I was, well, literally I'm not smart enough to, to have thought of this on my own. Just incredible. Other sanders I have, I have one of those little mini belt sanders, you know, half inch by 18. Wynn makes a super cheap one. I think that's what I have. And you can spend some big bucks like Makita and things. Um, they're used primarily in, in a metal working industry. That's where I first saw, saw them used. And I had this one particular job that 
it was perfect for. And it wasn't expensive, 25, 35 bucks, something like that. No, I don't use it every day. But again, when you need it, there's not another tool that will replace that other than your hands. And that gets to be a little old. I have a, a one of those super El Cheapo tabletop one inch by 30 inch belt sanders, you know, the little triangular belt sander thingies, um, you know, a little two, two amp motor on it. Oh my gosh, that thing is handy. And again, sometimes you just need something to avoid hand sanding. And I have one product that I don't even know how I would sand this without this thing. Uh, and, well, to be honest, I wouldn't make the product because I just honestly d don't want to hand sand that much. So it, it was cheap. I'm maybe 60, 70 bucks. And of course, if knife makers have these great big giant things that are really incredible, this is just a tiny little thing, you know, one inch wide belt. I have a six by 48 inch uh, stationary a sander comes with a, a nine inch disc sander uh, built into again super cheap i think i got this at the uh, the green box store um it was on sale 125 maybe 150 it's the off brand shop tool something like that uh white um yeah i bought that probably 15 years ago and it is going strong the only problem i had with it was that the platen, the thing that the sandpaper runs over top of, which registers flat. I don't know if the the rollers were set too far above the platen, but I, I couldn't get things flat on it. And so I ended up taking some old sanding belts, the, the six-inch wide sanding belts, and I think I used two pieces and literally glued those to the platen. So it kind of raised it up. Maybe there was an adjustment I could have done. This is what I did. And it has worked beautifully for, well, decades um, without very much money. I did not spend much money on this thing. I have a uh, an oscillating spindle sander that doesn't oscillate. <laughs> drives me nuts you can uh, attach a drum sander to a drill press and accomplish the same thing um, i bought this it was used i thought i could fix it it kind of worked i need to replace it so let's take a moment and talk about sandpaper and again i this isn't a an abrasives 101 uh, class a word about scales abrasive scales if you pick up a piece of sandpaper and it says like P120 on it, that P designates it as the European abrasive scale. And there's like, I don't know, 20,000 different scales depending on the industry that you're talking about. If you buy an American-made sandpaper, it's not going to have that P. It's just going to be 120 grit. They generally mirror each other until you get into the higher grits. And so if you're not paying attention, it's very easy to be using two different pieces of sandpaper of different grits that actually have the same size particles on the sandpaper. So it's the same. You think you're making progress when really you're just duplicating each other. The surest way of making sure that you are using progressive grits of sandpaper is to go by the micron diameter of the grit itself. And this could be like 10 microns or 25 microns, you know, 50 microns, 2 microns. And this information is on the internet. It's kind of hard to find. I've put together a, a worksheet that I've used in my my finishing classes called True Grit, no relationship with John Wayne, that if you would like a copy of that, a PDF of it, you know, send me an email and I'd be more than happy to send that out to you. So if you're 
just keep just be aware of that especially if you're using some of the super incredible japanese sandpapers that they have uh they are on a different scale and whenever you get into you know natural stones hard arkansas stones medium arkansas stones soft arkansas stone wichita stones Japanese water stones, it gets really, really confusing. And um, my sheet attempts to kind of sort this out based on the micron size. Now, currently, I'm using some Festool um, Garnet. Yeah, I know, I probably mispronounced that. Um, from 80 to 220 and about... 800 to 1,000. Uh, don't freak out. I use that primarily for fiberglass uh, boat repair work, um, not so much for, for woodwork. I'm also a big fan of ArborNet, and this is a, a Merca product. Uh, it's a net sandpaper as opposed to a paperback or cloth-backed paper from 120 to 600. I use this primarily to finish my finish. Honestly, the 120, unless you are sanding something that is dead flat, it's not the most durable paper. If you have edges that you have to go around or into, um, they can kind of get torn up. So I, I really prefer a, a paper-backed or a, a cloth-backed paper such as the uh, the, the garnet uh, for the, the lower grits. Now, I don't want to be a... Stick in the mud, a uh, hiding under a rock. So I do kind of pay attention to what's going out there as far as the the abrasive industry. And yeah, I've watched the YouTube videos just like you. And I bought a pack of 3M Cubitron. That's the 710W sandpaper. Wow. It is a net type sandpaper that eats wood. You need to remove some wood. I put this on the RO150. Even at 120 grit, it will grind wood away. It is super fast. I have one product that I have to grind over uh, uh, dovetails, and I thought it would fly apart just get eaten up by this, but it's not. And the thing about this, um, the 710, it's cheap. It's like uber cheap. Like, don't even compare to Festool cheap, or even the ArborNet for that matter. So what if you tear up one of these discs? <laughs> it is so, did I mention cheap? Yeah, yeah. I've been super impressed with it. I'm going to try some of the other grits, um, but 120 is what I use primarily for the, for the rough work. Super impressed with it. Now, I've included a uh, link to a, a YouTube video, um, the largest sandpaper test ever done in the show notes. Um, and as he mentions, uh, the future is ceramic. And yeah, I think he's on to something here. Advice? For your sanding system, and I know that you've had questions, find a system that works for you. You might need more than one sander. You probably will need more than one sander. Obviously, I'm a big fan of the Festool products. I know that they're expensive. If you need a little nudge to go over the edge, okay, consider this a push. I am just super impressed with these things. Are there other things out on the market that you could use? Yes, absolutely. Are they better? I've not used every system on the market, but I don't see how we can improve on this. This is just really, really good stuff. Okay, so maybe this did turn into a sales pitch for Festool. Ah, oh, God, I failed. When you buy sandpaper, buy the 50-pack or the 100-pack, you get the bulk you know, savings on that, and you don't run out of paper like every other week. Be mindful of that abrasive scale. Make sure that you're not duplicating grits. Now, I don't stock every grit for every sander. 
for the uh, little uh, uh, one inch uh, vertical sander, I think I have 120. I don't even think I have any other other grits for that because that's the only thing I use it. It's a one operation tool that does that incredibly well. For the uh, RO90, I have 80 grit, 120, and I might have some 180 that I can't remember the last time I used. For the 150, uh, from about 60 up to 1,000, it is such a versatile tool. I use it for everything. You know, that's the tool that you're going to have to pry out of my cold, dead hands. Hand sanding, we touched on. We avoided because everybody tries to avoid hand sanding. Dirty little secret. If you're using a machine to sand your work and it's any type of a rotating machine, you are probably leaving little swirl marks. I know even with my beloved Festool, it can leave swirl marks. So if you finish out at 150 or 180, oh, by the way, you people who are, are sanding to, to 320 or 400 raw wood, stop. You're polishing the wood. You're not sanding the wood. If you're putting a finish over top of this, that finish is not going to absorb into the wood because you have sanded to such an, a, a point, you have clogged all the pores, all the grain, and that finish isn't going to have good adhesion to that. There are some projects I sand to one, 120, and then I apply a finish, and I apply another coat of finish, and then I sand the finish and apply two more coats doing a final sand of the final finish at about 400 or 600 or sometimes 1,000. If you use an old uh, uh, paper shopping bag, that's equivalent to about 1,000. That does a good job of knocking off those little nibs, those little kamikaze you know, mosquitoes and things that always end up in your finish. How do they do that in the middle of the winter when the shop is like 60 degrees? I don't know. So when I'm hand sanding... I've made my own sanding block. You know, I'm not using a store-bought. I don't want to get beat up again. And it's, it's just a piece of hard maple that I have glued a piece of quarter-inch neoprene foam rubber onto one side. And on the other side, I have glued a piece of sheet cork. This gives just enough relief from that super hard wood that whenever I'm sanding, it it evens out the sanding stroke. If you use solid wood, sandpaper on solid wood, there's a tendency of it abrading or tearing or you can leave unsightly marks once you get the finish on top of that. And the way to avoid that is to kind of soften up the sandpaper, so to speak. That's why I use the cork. And anything that has an edge to it that I want a little bit rounded, then I flip the sandpaper around and use the neoprene side. I've, I've used this for decades and it works wonderfully. But this is what I use after the machine sanding with the grain. It takes like three seconds. If there are any marks on there, they are removed by just a few strokes. Now, if you have, you know, like molding or something like that that you can't use a sanding block on, you're going to end up sanding by hand. And I take the, the, I take a sheet of sandpaper. I cut that into, um, fourths. I actually tear it into four pieces. And then you can take that quarter and fold it into thirds so that you bury the abrasive. So you don't have two abrasive surfaces rubbing against each other. That's how you wear out sandpaper before you even sand a piece of wood. So with this piece of sandpaper, I can use my fingertips that grip the sandpaper and I can get into the little nooks and crannies, into the, the, the molding and things like that. The only problem with this situation is that your fingertips are in contact with sandpaper. And guess what happens to your fingertips, you know, after a while? Yeah, you 
sand off your fingerprints and then you can't pick anything up anymore. So little pro tip here, athletic tape. Yeah, if you played high school football, this is the stuff that they taped your ankles up with. You know, don't ask me about that. So it's super cheap. It's super sticky. Tape your fingers with the athletic tape and let the sandpaper abrade the tape instead of your fingertips. Brilliant. Wish I had thought of that myself. And come on, let's be honest. This is about as close to most of us ever getting to actually having to use athletic tape for, well, anything athletic. Missed jobs. Um, a young man contacted me about repairing a sofa. He had had some friends over the night before. I'm not sure if one of them was a large person or if they got a little rowdy, but someone sat in the middle of his sofa and broke it. How do you break a sofa? Well, he sent me pictures and yeah, this thing's broken. And the thing that really got me was that this sofa was made out of OSB. I don't know if it was Ikea, but it was made out of OSB, oriented strand board. This is what we use in, in construction, you know, roof decks, shear walls. We don't make sofas out of OSB, and it was stapled. And there was a center support that when this person sat on it, it literally just popped the piece of OSB off of it. And from the pictures that he sent me, I could see that the OSB was attached to another piece of OSB that was running transversely as like ribs in the sofa. Who uses OSB to make a sofa? So I... I well, honestly, I talked him into doing his own repair, and uh, I got to give it to the guy. Um, uh, he was, I asked, you know, are you handy with tools? He says, hey, I'm rebuilding my basement. I've got a cordless electric drill and a YouTube connection, and he was going for it. And so I, I told him how I would go about repairing this, and he was going to tackle it himself. But later that day, I was listening to Clark Howard. He's on YouTube, on podcast, on radio. Um, kind of a financial advice guru type person. And he was talking about furniture today is crap. You know, we, we have Ikea. Everybody knows Ikea. And everybody knows exactly what Ikea is. It's good, decent furniture in a box. And, you know, if you can't afford a lot of money, this will get you through for you know, a few years, several years, you know, until you have a three-year-old, then they'll destroy it. But he was talking about even high-end furniture is not built the way it used to be built, and that there's a, a movement afoot of buying old furniture. Now, I, I put a, a link in the show notes of, of one episode of his that he talks about this, but there was another like, you know, a Clark question type thing that he responded to. And he said that what a lot of people are doing now is that they're buying old furniture, old sofas. And uh, kind of the bugaboo has always been buying upholstered furniture. You don't know where that's been or what's living in it. Yeah, I can kind of see that. But, you know, everyone's terrified about bed bugs, which you really should be. But if that's been sitting in a showroom for 30 days or something, it's they've probably not been munching on anything and are probably all dead. But he said what people are doing is that they're buying these old sofas, 20, 40, 60, 80 years old, and having them reupholstered. And I immediately thought about a, a gentleman, he was a, a, a federal judge, who it's kind of a hobby of his. He's retired from the bench. But he buys old sofas, and he, he brought one to me that needed to be, it needed a lot of, it, it needed some repair work on it. 
And so I ended up stripping this thing off, making the wood repairs. And I'll be honest, it was really well built. I mean, this thing was very well crafted. And then he came and picked it up and took it to uh, an upholstery shop and he was having it reupholstered. Um, it's going to be gorgeous, just absolutely gorgeous and so much better built than the things that you have that you could buy now. So, you know, that might be a revenue stream for you. That might be something that you could get into to kind of check out. Um, probably go shopping for used furniture stores and see what's out there. Talk to the owner. I mean, you kind of build a symbiotic relationship there. And if you don't know anything about upholstery, I really encourage you to learn. I can do upholstery when I can't farm it off to anybody else. But it's a good skill to have, at least to have an understanding of upholstery. So recommendations, the thing about the uh, the fine multimeter, uh, there's a link in there about the uh, the largest sandpaper test ever done. And of course, the, the Clark Howard um, comments about uh, furniture. Special thanks to listeners in Detroit, Michigan and Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada, and the one listener in Pakistan. Really is appreciate you listening and i would greatly appreciate any support you could throw my way either buy me a cup of coffee or make a direct uh, donation on working at woodworking.com and of course i'm always open for any coach coaching sessions you can find you can find this podcast on youtube music they've just made the transition from the old google podcast platform over to youtube music you might also find some of my early attempts of becoming a youtuber in which i set up a camera and recorded video of me doing some various jobs and then overlaying that onto these normal podcasts and uploading it as a video um not terribly entertaining but i gave it a shot I think I had like 25 uh, videos um, I, I did. And then I, like, quite honestly, it's a crap load of work. And I just didn't have the time to pursue it. So anyway, I greatly appreciate uh, you listening. And until next time, happy woodworking.